Pro forma fun. Um, good to be here, everyone. I think uh, I'll speak to what I'm most familiar with. You can, you can think of real estate as building walls and building spreadsheets, and I'm the building spreadsheets guy. So um, we're going to talk a little bit. This is a 15-minute talk, so we're going to fly through this as quickly and efficiently as possible. Hopefully not too much information. I've made a lot of very high-level assumptions here. Um, I built this pro forma yesterday on a sample project, so don't overly scrutinize every number on there. Uh, it, it's not intended to be exactly 100% precise. Uh, but we're going to talk, just following up on this morning's conversation, what a pro forma looks like for a project that could be a four-unit multiplex with a garden suite in the back. Um, I picked a site for the purpose of this talk, a site that we actually looked at about a month ago, but just to highlight that sites like this exist in the city. So if you're curious, 52 Vernon Street is a site in the west end of the city that we looked at, we didn't end up purchasing, um, but sold for a million bucks. And so there are sites that sell in that price range. That's a big part of thinking about your pro forma in terms of like, what can you afford to pay for land? But I did use this one as an example. So we're gonna pretend for a second that we are the buyers of 52 Vernon Street, and we're gonna build, build a purpose-built rental fourplex with a garden suite in the back. We're gonna approach this as a major renovation and we're gonna figure out how to do that. How much equity are we gonna need? How much debt are we gonna need? What's it gonna to cost to, to construct this building? Um, and and I, without getting back into the planning conversations that we had this morning, I'm skipping over assumptions like how to you know, squiggle your way around development charges when you're building a four plus one. So we're just assuming here that you have been one of the creative people that could figure out how to do that. Um, so this is the site. It's uh, 52 Vernon Street. It's a 120-foot lot uh, by 25. It's a single-family home in reasonable condition. We're going to be using this structure as sort of the main structure that we're going to be renovating on top of. You can see the back is it's not a lane, so we're going to be building a garden suite as opposed to a laneway suite, uh, but sufficient depth here to fit something in the back as well. So 25 by 120. This would be a very common size lot in lots of parts of the city. And just want to show you what it might look like to build on this site. I grabbed a couple of um, very, so actually here's the summary. Uh, purchase price a million bucks. We're going to build a three-story fourplex. We're going to build a garden suite. Uh, and we're going to do this without triggering DCs. And we're going to just trust that that is possible if you're creative enough. Um, so let's get building. Here's what we're going to build. I found these random renderings online. Looks roughly like what we might want to build. Here's our three-story fourplex in the front of the building. It looks quite nice. It's been, you know, fits in with the character of the street. We're going to go to 19 meters deep here. Our, our, our lot depth is sufficient to support a 19 meter uh, or 62 foot uh, building depth in the front. We're going to go to 11 meters. We like to push the committee of adjustments a little bit. So we're going to ask for an extra meter of height. Um, 0 0.45 meter setback on one side of the building, 1.5 meter setback on the other. Again, forgive me for the rush. Uh, I'll, I'll share these, these slides with anybody who wants. And we're going to go to three stories, four units in the, mid, in the main structure. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the unit mix that we landed on just based on unit sizes that we can build. This main structure is going to get us to about 4150 GFA uh, or square footage sort of within the interior of the building, of which we're contemplating about 3,500 square feet of leasable area to split within these four units. Behind this main structure, we're going to build a garden suite. It's going to be a one-story garden suite. It's going to be five meters set back from the main building. Uh, just we don't have sufficient depth to go seven and a half meters, which you would need if you wanted to do a two-story garden suite. So in this case, we're going to be restricted to a one-story garden suite. It's going to be a small 500-square-foot garden suite, but we're going to be able to get about 450 square feet of leasable area out of the garden suite. So here's our project, four units in the front, one in the back. Estimated development timeline from acquiring the land to getting this thing leased up with tenants. We're going to say 21 months. That's probably a bit conservative. You could probably get something like this done in about 18 months, but we like to be conservative when we're building spreadsheets and then just overperform when we're actually in construction. Um, I'm estimating the budget on this to be $3.4 million, which includes land, construction, planning costs, et cetera. We'll walk through how I got to that number. And then just to jump to the end, we're, I'm, I'm assuming we're going to need about $600,000 of equity. And in order to raise that equity from people that might be interested in giving us money for this type of thing, we're going to be able to give them something around a 20% return on their investment for the timeline of this project. Um, this is sort of the conclusion of the pro forma, so we'll come back to how these numbers were generated. Um, this is a little small, so take photos if you want to zoom in. Uh, and again, feel free to ask me for these slides after the fact. I'm happy to share them. 
This is the summary of our pro forma. You'll see most pro formas are broken out into effectively three buckets of costs. You've got land costs, soft costs, and hard costs. Um, you know, there might be a few other things that you, you layer in, like financing costs, but generally speaking, you'll see most of your cost categories broken out like that. Land is obviously the price of the property, any costs associated with closing on the property. Soft cost is going to be anything from design to planning to city permitting. Uh, development charges, if any, would, would fall into this bucket. In this project, we're saying no development charges. Um, and other sort of municipal fees, et cetera. Hard costs is your labor and materials to build the building. We'll, we'll go into how I estimated that uh, to get us to the sort of subtotal, in this case, of just under $3 million. But we're going to have to borrow money on this thing. I'll show you how much money we can borrow and how I got to that number. But there's going to be a cost to finance this project. We're going to be paying interest on that loan. It's about $300,000 of interest we're going to pay during this period of time. Um, and, uh, but we also want to make money out of it, right? We're the, we're the person developing this thing. I'm going to show you how an investor might make money out of this project and how we as the, the developer might make money out of this project. Okay, so, you know, think about those two, those two sort of uh, people as two distinct participants in the project. When this thing is built, it's going to generate on the right-hand side projected revenues, NOI, net operating income, of $154,000 a year. Um, I'm going to assume that this thing is valued at a 4.25 cap rate when it's completed. This is what somebody will use to value your rental building, which means when it's, once it's built, it, this building is going to be worth $3.642 million. Okay? Our total costs are 3.38. Value on completion, 3.64. We're making a profit on this building of $250,000 after paying ourselves fees, after sort of earning revenue along the way. Um, but effectively, that's the profit that I can go back and share with the investor who gave me the money to buy the land and build this thing, okay? So let's jump into each of these sections. Again, super, super fine print. Um, but all this to say, I don't, the, the lines are not as important. Happy to share this, this spreadsheet format. Um, but what is important is that you're breaking out every single cost you anticipate hit, uh, incurring while you're going through the life cycle of this development. Every consultant you're going to hire, every fee you're going to pay, every construction you know, line item. In here, construction is summarized as a single line. Underneath that, you would see an like a full construction budget. Um, you, you heard Ryan this morning talking about construction costs for major renovations being somewhere between 275 and 300 and. $15 a square foot, I think he said. I estimated this at $325 a square foot. Gives us a little bit of wiggle room. I put a contingency on my construction budget of uh, 5%, so a little bit of wiggle room to make some mistakes. And I'm also assuming in this case that I can act as the general contractor. So this is, you know, for those of you in the room who have any experience building either your own house or you are a general contractor and you're thinking about how to move into development, opportunity for you to keep the CM fee, the construction management fee, as part of your revenue. Um, and then further down this pro forma, something we call a development management fee, which is sort of managing the entire process through entitlements, land acquisition, et cetera. So a couple of revenue lines that you could either see as yourself keeping, or you might have to hire out a general contractor, for example. And then that fee would go to your general contractor um, as opposed to you keeping it yourself. I mean, I think if, if you've got the experience uh, of building you know, major renos in a single family home or home building, this is very much within the wheelhouse of what somebody who historically has been a, you know, home builder or general contractor could theoretically take this on. And often what's the most intimidating part is knowing how to build the financial model, knowing how to raise money, knowing how to get the debt. But the construction itself, you know, if you're a, a reasonably um, experienced general contractor, you could probably manage this scale on your own. So let's skip past the cost, get into how buildings are valued when they're completed. Rental buildings, as this one is, are, complete, are valued based on their uh, at-occupancy stabilized rental income. We call this the net operating income. There's two things to think about when you're calculating your net operating income. Is One, how much rent do I expect to get from the units when they're leased? And minus, what cost do I have to incur to operate the building? I have to pay property taxes. I have to pay... Uh, utilities on common areas. I may have to pay for some property management, putting the garbage out, mowing the lawn, things like that. Luckily for us, if we're going to be using CMHC for financing on this, which the model assumes we will, CMHC also provides sort of like rough guidelines on how to estimate these costs. So this box on the right is an estimate of costs around what you might expect to pay to own and operate a building like this. 
So we're getting to about $198,000 of effective gross income. Um, you'll notice in there there's a 2% vacancy assumption that CMHC likes to see. Uh, we're estimating rents at $4.27 per square foot. It varies slightly from the bigger units. We've got a three-bedroom unit, three two-bedroom units, and a one-bedroom garden suite. So you can see what the rents are projected there in the west end of Toronto in a nice, stable family neighborhood, not unreasonable rents. Um, and then we're going to be spending about $43,000 operating this building on an annual basis. That's how we get to the net operating income that I mentioned in the first slide, the $154,000, 792. All right, how much debt can I get if I'm making that amount of money on this building? It, the, the first assumption I'm making here is that this is a CMHC MLI select financed project, which means you heard it earlier by a gentleman in the crowd. Um, we're building this thing with 100 points of energy efficiency in mind. For those of you who don't know what that means, CMHC effectively allows for really, really favorable um, debt guarantees to lenders if you meet certain requirements in energy efficiency. So we're building to those energy efficiency standards to be able to get this MLI Select program. Um, that program is going to cap the amount of debt we can take out based on one of two things, the lower of two numbers, either one, um, a, a formula that is based on our net operating income, which is the part on the left, so this max loan amount of $2.78 million, or number two, they'll also look at what would the loan be if you were able to borrow up to 95% of the total costs of your project. They'll then take the lower of those two numbers and allow you to borrow that much. Okay, so in this case, we're being capped by this formula on the left, the net operating income. Uh, the DSCR, without getting too, too much in the weeds, is effectively the maximum amount that you can be spending in a year to service your debt. They look at your net operating income. They divide that by 1.1. They want to see that you have a 10% buffer. So I'm making $154,000 a year. The maximum debt service I will able, be able to borrow is $140,000 a year debt servicing costs. So then I can work backwards. So what's that max loan amount? Okay, so in this context, CMHC is allowing for 50-year amortizations if you meet these criteria uh, with a, with a CMHC-approved lender. So I'm getting to a loan amount here. You'll have to trust the math of $2.78 million, okay, and change, so $2.781 million. Now that I know how much debt I can get on the project, I can effectively just work backwards to how much equity am I gonna need. The total cost of the project is 3.388. The total loan I'm gonna get approved for is 2.78. That leaves me with a shortfall or an equity requirement of $607,000. So you're gonna need about $607,000 in equity. Most people don't have that sitting around in their bank account. So how do I raise that money and what kind of return can I promise to my family and friends or that rich guy down the street that's willing to write me a check to get this project going? So how much money will this deal make for my investors? We just went out, we raised 600 grand and change from an investor and you do the math to get them to a rate of return of just under 20%, which is actually not a bad deal in today's market. If you're looking at, you know, there's very... I shouldn't say no risk in these projects because you got to build these things, you got to stay on timeline, but there's very little planning risk. These are permitted in the city. There's very little market risk in terms of like, do people want to rent in Toronto? Yes, people want to rent in Toronto at these rates. Probably the only real risk is like, are you a qualified construction manager who's actually going to build this thing on time and on budget? But if you can go around and shop this deal and say, hey, I've got an interesting deal. I can, ge I can generate roughly 20% return. Uh, then look for somebody to, to sort of support you on that deal. So they're going to make about 20% on their money. That's all well and good. We're all doing this to make money for investors. We're also doing it to make money for ourselves. So how do you make money in this deal? Um, we're going to have the ability to charge potentially three things. And again, I say potentially because if you're not acting as the construction manager, you may have to pay that fee to a general contractor. But if you are acting as a construction manager on your own deal, you could theoretically be charging to your project the development management fee. Here I estimated it at 4% of the overall budget. A construction management fee, which I estimated at 10% of my construction budget, and then a GP promote without getting into the weeds is effectively you saying, hey, I'm creating value by building this building. I want a share of the profit that is generated in the sort of return that is created. So the investor is sharing some of the return back with you as the developer. So in this case, let's say over a 21-month period, um, I was able to generate $312,000 in value. This assumes that on completion, we're turning around and we're selling the building to somebody who buys these types of things. So cash flow is generated on the sale of the building. My investor gets paid their 20% return. I've earned my fees and I've earned my promote, my $45,000 on top of my fees. 
And uh, we just made $310,000 in, in 21 months. And, and the reality at this scale is if you get comfortable with these models, and obviously we'll have to spend a lot more time than 15 minutes going through them, then you could probably start doing many of these at the same time. This is a scale where a reasonable one or two person development team with the capabilities to do this could quite easily be starting one of these projects, let's say once every six months or so, and you start building a business model just by, by continuing to do that. So I'll stop there. Um, again, my name's Matt. Uh, I work at Toronto Standard. Hit me up. I'm happy to walk through this in details and share slides with anybody who's interested. Thanks. <laughs>